So excited to be here. Kat, your energy is infectious, I have to say. It's a lot of fun. Um, first of all, disclosures. Uh, we have a minority interest in a company emulate I'm going to talk about. I'm actually on the DSMB for Novartis Gene Therapy product for SMA. Uh, I've actually chair that, and uh, I'm on the scientific board of Koya. This is quite fun to be in this position because I'm kind of translating between models that you heard from Hans just now in vivo to actual clinical trials, and that'll set up the stage for the CERN trials later on. And at the end, I'm going to mention uh, a look into the future, which is some of the work we're doing in space, but just one or two slides on that, otherwise I won't have time. Um, and this is a hats off to Sheila. Uh, thanks for uh, pulling together uh, this review with Arun Sharma, who's in the audience. Uh, and I think the key here is that um, over time, we've developed uh, more sophisticated models. So initially, iPS cells, Yamanaka discovered, are great. You can make neurons in the dish. But essentially, you can then use different models, if you heard from Hans, organoids, other technologies, uh, to go along this runway here and get more and more sophisticated. And as you go in this direction, you actually decrease your throughput, but you increase the uh, validity of the model. And right at the end here, uh, we have chimeric animals where you can actually combine the cells uh, with, to make chimeras. And the further that way you go, the more complex it gets. I'm going to stick in the middle here. You've already heard about organoids. I'm going to talk about organ chip technology and how we can maybe integrate that. And I've been doing this for a little while. The first uh, uh, paper we had was modeling spinal muscular atrophy, where we actually saw motor neurons die in the dish. Um, in, just like they do in the kids, uh, by using IPS-derived motor neurons. We then did Huntington's disease, uh, a rare disease, MCT8. Uh, then it got into a lot of collaborations in using multi-omics to discover more complex pathways. Uh, we've also been uh, in Parkinson's disease. And one of the themes uh, for us has been to use early onset disease. And why do we look at early onset? Because we think there'll be a stronger phenotype in your IPS model if you go for an early onset degenerative disease. And this is particularly true for Parkinson's. When we looked at early onset Parkinson's, we found a nice phenotype uh, as shown in that paper. The, t the disease I really want to focus on today is ALS. This is the one you do not want to be diagnosed with in neurology. Uh, there's no treatment. Uh, there's very limited drugs. Um, we do know two mutations that predominantly cause ALS, along with about 20 others now. Uh, SOD1 and C9ORF, and I'll talk about C9ORF uh, in a moment. Um, but most, most ALS cases are sporadic, so we don't know what causes the disease. And the challenge is how do we model a disease when you don't know what causes it? We don't know the mechanisms. So I think that was one of our goals early on, was to tackle sporadic ALS by using IPS modeling. To do this, we uh, model development. As you all well know, <laughs> these protocols now, in fact, Lawrence Studer was Amphibians here. Uh, Lawrence Studer with the dual SMAD started this field where we can now take iPS cells and push them down the neuronal lineage. And what's quite remarkable to me is how similar those motor neurons are to the motor neurons in the spinal cord when you use these technologies of differentiation. Uh, unfortunately, they're not as mature, and that's one of the, the challenges of iPS technology. They're young motor neurons, but nonetheless, we can do it. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, four or five papers and four or five years of work to kind of get to the point of scale. We need to do this in large numbers of neurons, just like genomics. We probably need more than four lines per, per case, which is the normal paper, and get to larger scale. So we created Answer ALS, and this is just an acknowledgment slide uh, for all the folks on this uh, project, where we've created 1,000 IPS lines from patients with ALS across the country. And I'm ha happy to say, Cedar and I made the lines. We just did our, uh, almost our last line a few months ago. So uh, we have all the lines made. And now we're differentiating them all into motor neurons, and the idea is to see if there are any subtypes of ALS come out from those studies. Uh, we did just publish a paper recently that you can go to, and I'm not going to go into any details, but essentially this was the first large-scale differentiation. See here we had uh, 340 ALS and 92 control cases. We differentiated them all into motor neurons, and we didn't separate ALS and control with RNA-seq. We looked at RNA-seq activity. They pretty much overlapped. So there wasn't a smoking gun signal for ALS. We're going to have to do a lot more work to figure that out. But what we did find, uh, interestingly, um, was this uh, male and female difference. We thought motor neurons would be pretty similar between males and females. Well, it turns out the motor neurons on RNA-seq, the males and females separate completely. We, s we see the males on one part of the RNA-seq structure and females on the other. So motor neurons are very different males and females, and this really impacts our clinical trials because normally you'll enroll equal numbers of males and females, and maybe you have a drug that works for females but not for males. So there's a lot of uh, 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 ongoing studies for this uh, data set, 
Uh, it is online, answerals.org. If you go, you can access all of the omics data that we generated from these lines. Um, there are other methods of differentiation. There's lots of data here I don't have time to go into. Uh, groups like Justin Achida, Hideyuki Okano. If you go to pay, poster 18, <laughs> uh, Gene Neo, uh, postdoc, had a fantastic poster yesterday. It's, hopefully it's still up tonight. Go have a look. Because we're working more and more on these models to, to understand how they work and how we can model disease and then go in with drugs that can treat them. But is there a better way? And, and I, following Hans, I always have to show a video. <laughs> um, and this is uh, from Sam, from, from the WIS Institute and Don Ingber's group. And so I met Don a few years ago, and we thought, you know, this is a technology that's going to maybe make a difference. Uh, these are the microfluidic devices. Um, they have a membrane in the middle that's shown there. And this is called a lung on a chip. And what, what Don does is put lung cells in the top channel and then endothelial cells on the bottom channel. And what's quite remarkable with this technology is you can make the lung breathe. It has a vacuum at the, at the side which can stretch. So now you've simulated lung breathing. Um, and so you can actually also use gut on a chip. And I'm not going to have time to talk in much detail. I'll do a couple of slides on that later because you can stretch the gut. But for the lung, you push air through the top channel and blood through the bottom. Now, if, I'm going to show you the neural version of this. Uh, and it's going to have blood on the bottom channel and brain on the top. So I'm just getting you primed. Now, with the lung, it's kind of incredible. You can do a bacterial infection by blowing bacteria through the lung part of this chip. And as the bacteria stick to these uh, epithelial lung cells, the blood flowing below it with, with the uh, monocytes in detects that the, uh, the, the bacteria is there. They migrate through these pores that are within the chip membrane, and they kill the bacteria. So you basically mi mimicked inflammation on a chip. Uh, and for CAT, we can actually model cancer metastasis on a chip by looking at how the cancer cells go through and into the tissue. And this is live uh, GFP label, GFP label blood cells, monocytes, flowing through the bottom of the chip. And now you've put the microscope on them. And when they detect the infection on the top, they stop. Uh, individual monocyte, you'll see, migrates through the pore up to the top to tackle the infection. So you've been mimicked essentially here. You'll see it crawl up through the channel. And now when it gets to the top, <clears throat> you'll see it attack the uh, bacteria and kill it. So this is inflammation on a chip. And so we asked, uh, could you do this with neurological disorders? So I'm going to show you a very high level now uh, an overview of what we've been doing for the last few years. Uh, most of this uh, is unpublished. Uh, this is the platform. There's no tubes in the emulate platform. Uh, in fact, it's quite neat. Uh, it just uses vacuum to push the fluids through. So you put the chip into this device. It's a, it's a little science fiction uh, And it pushes the fluids through and collects the fluids uh, automatically. Uh, working with Eric Schuster uh, at the University of Wisconsin and others, we started developing ways to generate the cells we want. Of course, we can make motor neurons so from one IPS line. But Eric and I, uh, many years ago, uh, discovered you can make BMECs. These are brain endothelial cells that line the blood vessels of the human brain. So now we can make an isogenic blood-brain barrier chip. And that was really the goal. Uh, we published this again, thanks to Sheila. Uh, we published this some time ago uh, in, uh, in Cell Stem Cell. And the bottom line here is a, it's a, it's a quite a long paper. I'm just showing one uh, snippet. Is we in, in the end, we could put whole patient blood. And this could be the same patient that the iPS cells came from. We can flow it through the bottom channel. And then actually, by putting TNF alpha on the top, we can simulate a hemorrhage and get a blood-brain barrier leak. And we can also test drugs. And the drugs that you would expect to get across, get across. And the drugs that you would not expect to get across, do not. So this is a fairly good simulation of the blood-brain barrier. Adding flow is much more physiological. Uh, we remove waste constantly uh, as we go through the uh, blood-brain barrier model. And you can then do sampling. <clears throat> you can sample just like you would from a patient. So we think of these chips as patients in the lab. In fact, they cost about $600 each, so they're very expensive. So we try and get as much out of the chip as we can. Uh, right now, they'll live about 28 days. Uh, we're, we're understanding now with different technologies, we can get them to live longer. Now, NIH uh, saw the value of this. This is NCAT's uh, programs for organ chip technology. I was very fortunate to get one of the first grants from NIH. And this is a great uh, group because we meet once a year. Uh, we all talk about chip technologies, but from every single organ <laughs> aspect. And I'll tell you how we're tying organs together uh, in a moment. The first uh, one I'm just going to give you a high-level view is uh, when we try to develop ALS on a chip and Parkinson's on a chip. Uh, here's our uh, organ chip system now. Uh, Sam Sances, the grad student, developed this originally. Uh, you can see the 3D spin there. The blood vessels are on the bottom in that tube, and they line the bottom of the chip, and the motor neurons up there are on the top. These motor neurons are electrophysiologically active. Uh, there's an open-top chip for California. We have to have an open-top chip. <laughs> you can access it. That was a reference to cars. Uh, so 
Open top trip means you can do electrophysiological recording. Now, just a little data, and again, I don't want to uh, l go on this too far. This is unpublished, um, but I'm very impressed with the maturation we get. Uh, you can see the cells here in the chip in three dimensions. They form a, a quite a thick layer, almost like an organoid on top of the chip. We get motor neurons. Now, unlike in the 2D cultures, we're starting to separate with PCA now, just an RNA-seq. We can almost separate control and AS, ALS lines completely just by maturing them further and exposing them to the blood vessels. And we're picking out specific genes now in differential gene analysis that correlate with the ALS phenotype. And now I think we're getting close to the heart of ALS and understanding mechanisms and genes that are affected in this subgroup of patients. Now, this is only four lines with ALS and five control. We're now increasing the number of lines. We're, of course, bringing in single nuke seq. Uh, what the beauty is a complex chip, but if you dissect it out and do single nuke seq, seq you can get the BMECs down here. Um, and then you get progenitors on the right and, and the constant maturation through to the fully mature motor neurons. And in, with this technology, with the chip technology, you get two clusters of motor neurons uh, shown here. Um, one is a, called a medial motor neuron and the other is a spinal accessory motor neuron. If you don't use a chip technology, you get a blur of neurons, motor neurons. The chip technology is bringing out the maturation, allowing us to look at subtypes uh, within these models. And now this is, uh, again, uh, the work of uh, uh, Dr. Lyle Sances and Workman, uh, who pulled this all together, uh, we we'll hope to be submitting it very, very soon. And essentially, uh, we find now DEGS, differentially expressed genes, and we can look just in that population of motor neurons uh, down here, pick those out, and look at the gene expression patterns that are different between ALS and control. Excitingly, we're finding, uh, and this will come back to my astrocyte story in a moment, one of the main pathways seems to be glutamate receptor activity. And it's long been known in ALS that glutamate receptors are important. The only drug that has been around the longest is Rilazole that acts on glutamate uptake. So we're hinting now that at this uh, stage, we might have uh, a pathway that we can start looking at and interacting with. And of course, because it's on a chip, we can add drugs uh, in the flow. We can add it to the, either the brain side or the blood, brain barrier side, uh, the blood side, and helping us get uh, drugs for targeting. The other brief vignette I'll give, a uh, very high level again, uh, is the second grant that we got from NCATS. And this was called Clinical Trial on a Chip. And this is a nice segue to my next section, which is a real clinical trial in a patient. Um, clinical Trial on a Chip, the idea was, could you uh, predict or produce a, a clinical trial on an organ chip system? And we, here we collaborated with Bill Seeley, who's at UCSF. And the, the, the theme here, when Bill and I chatted, he had actual patient samples from patients who died of uh, FTD, frontal temporal dementia. And if you know frontal temporal dementia uh, can be caused by C9-ORF, uh, repeats of the C9-ORF gene, repeat expansions in the C9-ORF gene. This is pretty horrific. If you have C9-ORF, you can either get frontal temporal dementia or you can get ALS. And you don't know which you're going to get, but you'll get one of them. And so we're very fascinated by how this works and could we model uh, frontal temporal dementia better. And Bill actually had post-mortem samples from, a, from seven or eight patients. So I thought it would be interesting to get fibroblasts from those patients who are already dead, and we have the pathology, and see if we could look at the IPS neurons and see if we could mimic some of that pathology. Uh, this is just quickly uh, a, a quick overview of C9-ORF. C9-ORF leads to a haploinsufficiency. The, the C9-ORF protein goes down to about 50%. That seems to cause some of the problems with this, with this repeat expansion in the C9-ORF gene. And then the, uh, this, this repeat expands like a machine gun. It spits out these dipeptide repeats, which we think might be toxic to the patient. So it's a very complex biology. I could, I could do a whole hour's lecture on C9-ORF. Um, but these are the two major phenotypes. Uh, we collected iPS cells from Bill Seeley that, uh, again, uh, subjects that we had brain post-mortem samples for. We made their iPS lines from fibroblasts. And the question is, can we see pathology? Is it possible to do a clinical trial on a chip? And does it correlate, the IPS pathology, does it correlate with the pathology that we found at death uh, in the patient? Now, here we need a cortical trip, chip, um, and DeepD worked hard to get IPS cells. The beauty with IPS cells, you can make them into any tissue. So we pushed them down all these different routes. And we've got microglia, cortical cells, motor, uh, cortical neurons, and then, of course, the, the brain microvascular cells. Put them in the organ chip system. Uh, they look pretty cool. They uh, differentiate very well. And in this system, we get astrocytes spontaneously, so you get astrocytes for free. And if you look at them down the microscope, the uh, microglia in purple at the bottom are dotted throughout the culture. So we've really formed a full, mature cortical culture. And what's really cool uh, along the side here, these are the five patients that we did. 
you can see each patient has its own number of dipeptide repeats. Remember those abnormal dipeptides that are spat out. Some patients have a lot. Some patients don't have many. We don't know what it means. But this model is beautiful because now we can look at dipeptide repeat uh, release into the media flowing over the chip and collect it. And what's even more fascinating is the one case uh, in, in our study that had lots of these dipeptide repeats and antisense foci was the case that Bill found post-mortem had a lot of foci. So we're correlating now post-mortem biology, post-mortem anatomy, with in vitro ips divide modeling. And this could be a great predictor of where your disease is going. Because remember, you can do this before the patient even gets FTD. Because it's IPS technology, you can take it from a patient pre-symptomatic. So I think this is very powerful. Um, for prediction. Uh, Bill's been working all over the summer on NukeSeq from the brain, so we're, oh, some, am I out of time already? <laughs> um, I think I'll go a little longer. So we have, uh, we developed this uh, assay, you don't have to look at all this, but in vivo assay, so we can sample from the chips uh, all the time, all these different biomarkers. And now we're working, uh, we're in the process of working with Denali on some of their drugs, Acuristem and Ionis. Ionis do all the ASO technology. And we're seeing if their drugs, when we put them in the chip environment, how do they work? Do they, do they reverse any of the phenotypes? So we're doing our clinical trial on the chip, and I think that's really exciting. And we hope that, hopefully that will predict responses and do a precision health trial eventually um, on patients. Merit Shukovic has a Healy trial at MGH, and we're tying into her trial. And the idea is to make iPS cells from patients running into the trial and seeing if we could predict their outcome in the trial from iPS technology. So we're very excited about this. Now, I took this slide out, but I put it back in after, and I'm sorry, this might run me over a few seconds, um, because I, when Hans was talking about uh, the microbiome, uh, I have to tell you uh, about this study we're doing. And in Parkinson's disease, uh, your microbiome, you get gut problems 20 years before you get Parkinson's in many cases. And we don't understand the connection. I mean, there's lots of ideas here. Uh, but we asked a simple question. Well, first, we made a dopamine neuron on chip. This just came out, uh, so we can make dopamine neurons, put them on the chip. Uh, and they get uh, a very good maturation. Um, and this really was the Allen Institute that funded this. And this great guy, Mike Workman, who came from Jim Wells' lab and was a gut guy. And I converted him to a brain guy, but I think he's going back to gut. But I'll tell you now, he actually wants to do both. Because what he did is, uh, first we made the dopamine chip. Uh, and together with uh, some other groups at Regenta Medicine at Cedars, we made a gut on a chip. And I wish I could show you all the videos from this, like Hans, but I don't have time. It's a fantastic gut on a chip. And from the same patient now, you can make their dopamine neurons from the brain and their gut and put them on a chip. And uh, he went further than that. With Susan Dev Devcota here at Cedars, uh, we put the microbiome on. And this is one of the nastiest studies I've done in the lab. So you have to have poop samples coming in. Nobody wants that in their lab, believe me, bacteria. Um, but when he put it on to microglia initially, he could see a nice response of the microbiome to the microglia. And now, of course, we're thinking in terms of uh, intestine chips from the patient combined with dopamine, with chips with their dopamine neurons. And we can actually link the two chips together. So we can pass effluent off of our gut chip that has a microbiome, put it onto the brain chip of the same patient. And I think this is precision health. It's utilizing all of the power of IPS technology and utilizing the power of these new advanced models. And so we're really pushing this forward. We'd like to do a clinical trial at Cedars as soon as we can, and we're lining that up with patients. Uh, we'd like to get this published as soon as we can as well. We're, we're lining that up as well. All right, switching gears uh, for my last 10 minutes, uh, I'd like to transition now. And I think for the rest of the meeting, we're going to be transitioning uh, more into clinical work and clinical trials. And uh, we've had a long history of working uh, in this space. And this is my favorite. I'm just going to very quickly show this. Uh, of course, we have different uh, types of tissue for making neural stem cells. And I was sitting with Irv this morning in the, in, in the cab coming over here. And he said, Clive, you know, I still work on neural stem cells. I said, sure. Said, well, I had a cell paper just two months ago. <laughs> and I looked it up. Sure enough, Irv has a cell paper. Just came out. You've got to go read it on how we make from fetal brain tissue uh, these neural progenitor cells. And really, everybody's in the same field. You've got to make the neuroprogenitors. You've got to make them into the brain types, neurons, oligos, and astrocytes. And then we look, look at using them. You're going to hear a wonderful talk from Vivian in a minute where we use them to make dopamine neurons. Um, we can use them for spinal cord injury uh, or, or uh, MS by making oligodendrocytes. But my focus now is just going to be on this cell, the astrocyte. It gets left out quite often, but I'm going to make a pitch for the astrocyte. It's the most important cell in the brain. Uh, because it can support neurons. All your neurons were born before you were. And that, I have this weird British accent because I have British neurons. <laughs> and I want to keep my British neurons. And so the brain does regenerate in certain parts, but not, not very efficiently. So to keep them, we can protect them. And that's the idea of the astrocyte. 
Now, here's a horrific, uh, complex model of ALS, but really I just want you to focus on the key cell, which is this astrocyte right here. And the astrocyte's protecting, it, it helps the blood brain barrier, it's forming a lot of ancestral functions. And then uh, I'm also going to bring in GDNF because in some early studies we did, the astrocyte transplants seemed to do well in models of ALS, but when we super boosted them by making them produce this drug GDNF, which you can't get through the blood brain barrier, the effect was even more powerful as a synergistic effect of these two together. And this is known from Chris Henderson many years ago to be a, p a potent uh, neuroprotective factor for motor neurons undergoing death. So the idea, the hypothesis we wanted to test 10 years ago was could, if you, could you replace the astrocytes, combine it with GDNF, and slow motor neuron death in, in ALS and then potentially in other disorders as well. Now, astrocytes have a great history, uh, this, great reviews. This one from Shane Lidlow recently. And there's, there's just like the, the, for those of you immunologists, and I think most of you are here, it's just like the immune system with the monocytes. There's good astrocytes in blue on the left and bad ones uh, on the right. So we want to get the bad ones away and replace them with good ones. And I think that's the concept of, of what we're going to do. And in fact, some support for this came from Steve Goldman in a great paper in Nature Biotech recently, where he uh, did this experiment. We did a little news and views on it, where he essentially made chimeric mice. Uh, he put glial cells in from Huntington's embryonic stem cells. He made glial cells. So you have Huntington's glial cells. He left the mouse to cook for 32 weeks. So now it's a chimeric mouse with Huntington's glial cells. And then he did a second transplant of normal glial cells. And, it, and guess what? The normal glial cells hunted down the, the Huntington's ones and replaced them. They actually took them out. And it's a beautiful paper. Go look at it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. But it actually is a big support for the idea of replacing astrocytes in the adult brain. And that's really given us a lot of hope. The cells that we uh, use in our studies uh, come from fetal tissue that I'm going to tell you about now. Uh, we have a unique way of growing them, this uh, chopping method which allows them to grow for long periods. We don't purify out a cell like Irv does uh, with his new cell paper, but that's another technique. I think you'll get a, a, a good, better cell. This is a messy one. Some of the best drugs are messy. Um, uh, this, this neural progenitor has a lot of different uh, features to it. Um, but it works very well. It's very reliably grown. We can en engineer it with GDNF, lenti GDNF. And then you've got your magic cells, which are cells that produce GDNF, astrocytes that produce GDNF. And we've done a, a large number of studies on these. Uh, we've manufactured them now in CGMP facilities across, in fact, we've collaborated with many different uh, partners to get the cells to the point where we now have a product. And the product is very simple. Uh, you inject it into the spinal cord in the red dots here. This is in an uh, ALS mouse. And the cells then migrate, an ALS rat, the cells migrate up and down the cord. All those red dots are human cells with a human marker that migrate up and down the cord. And what we found is the GDNF is produced. This is an antibody, a section through the, the spinal cord. GDNF is produced just where the cells are, which is rather nice because GDNF gives side effects if it goes in the wrong place. Just where the cells are, you get the GDNF. And if you look down here, those you can see in purple, the reason there's all these big black dots here is these are surviving cholinergic motor neurons shown here only on the side of the transplant. They all died on the other side because we only transplanted unilaterally in the rat. And this actually was the concept for the uh, clinical trial. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, two stories, clinical stories, quickly. Uh, the first one, uh, we focused down here because the FDA wanted us to go as low as possible so we wouldn't cause any damage. So we focused on the lumbar region. Uh, with CIRM's help, and this is where CIRM have, uh, for the last 10 years, funded this research, and it's been fantastic. There's nothing like CIRM anywhere else in the world. Uh, we made a GMP lot. We did the dose ranging tumor tox studies, and we uh, filed an IND that was 4,500 pages. My wife was the only one who read the whole thing, um, and she was fantastic in helping getting this through. Uh, and and uh, Pablo Avalos is here in the audience, and, and the team pulled this together, and we did uh, the trial. And I'm not going to go through this trial. I've talked about it. Many of you probably heard me talk before. Please. Just go look at the paper. We just published this uh, last year, uh, late last year. And what's nice, I think, is it really tells a story in this paper from all the preclinical data all the way through to the trial and the outcomes in one paper. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, and uh, we're, we're um, very proud of the surgeons and the teams. And Bob Baylor was the PI on this uh, project before he left for Roche um, at Cedar sinai And very quickly, we got cells. The main bottom line of this is we got cell survival for up to four years. And just like in the rat I just showed you, if you can see over here on the right, the patient, this patient who died and donated the, the spinal cord had a nice surviving transplant secreting GDNF for four years. So I think the point here is we can get the cells to survive. Um, and in this case, um, we did a lot of uh, looking at the patient's ability to use the treated leg 
and compared to the non-treated. We only did one side. It's a unique transplant where you just do one side of the cord. So anything in this uh, graph here over time, anything above the line is good, means that the treated leg was doing better than the non-treated, and that the, if both were the same, it would be in the middle. So the bottom line is all the patients did a little better. We never quite reached significance. It's a very small group, and it was very, uh, Vivian and I were just talking, these were quite late patients for safety, but we did reach the primary endpoint of safety, which means we can now go ahead, uh, just like I think you'll hear from Vivian in a minute, to do more patients uh, with more uh, doses and a slightly better targeting. The targeting was a little higher than we wanted in these patients, so now we're going lower with early onset. So we're very excited to do this. We continue to analyze the data. This is a collaboration with David Rowich, a good, good friend of mine who's the chair of neurology, uh, pediatrics, sorry, in Cambridge. And they've actually now managed to detect the cells with WRPE, which is part of the gene we put in using in situ. And it's rather beautiful because now we can show the cells in green here actually express glast and are actually astrocytes. So we've now got proof and evidence that the cells can transplant, they make astrocytes, and survive for four years. I'll also point out, we were talking of this morning, after one year, we removed all suppression from these patients. So they've had the transplant for three years with no immune suppression. So cells can survive in the brain for this amount of time, stem cell-derived transplants. We've known that in the Parkinson's field for many years uh, from all the work you're going to hear from Vivian in a minute from uh, primary fetal transplants. But these stem cells can survive for extended periods of time. The issue with ALS is it's not a pure motor neuron disease of the spinal cord. It also involves the upper motor neuron. And this is a real problem. If we can stop the degeneration of the motor neurons in the spinal cord, if you can't activate it with your upper motor neuron, you're still not going to move. So about four years ago, I was convinced to do this. I didn't really want to do this. I was too, we were too focused on, on the spinal cord. But as usual, I think someone said yesterday, Gretchen hounded me, Gretchen Thompson, to do the upper motor neuron. So I said, OK, you go, you know, let's do it. And I was absolutely shocked by the results. Um, and this paper summarizes the data. Now we're putting the cells into the upper motor neurons. Into the, and I didn't really think this was going to work. But when we put the cells just in the upper motor neuron in the rat model, we actually saw better functional improvements than we did when we put them in the spinal cord. So these are treated cell animals here. This is a paralysis score. And you can see the non-treated animals are going down fast. So actually, the upper motor neuron, if you block that, seemed to be stopping the lower motor neuron from dying. So I'm doing all this effort putting the cells in the spinal cord. We might just need to put them in the cortex. So that pushed us, pushed us very hard with Chris Bankovich, as some of you know. We did preclinical studies in monkey. I'm going to skip through this very fast to get to this one, which is my favorite slide. This is a homunculus in humans. So if you want to do brain surgery and you want to go into the motor cortex, you have to pick an area because it's a long motor strip. And a long story short, we picked the hand knob. Uh, it's one area that you really want to maintain function if you're a patient. And it's an area that's easy to target for our neurosurgeons. And so we went with the hand knob. Uh, this is the trial. It's actually open right now. Um, and the, the PI is Rich Lewis, and Pablo, who's here, is, is doing most of the work of the, the, the organization, and it's completely sponsored by and funded by CERN. Uh, this is a safety trial, uh, actually the same product, endpoints of safety, secondary endpoints I'll talk about in a second, uh, uh, muscle strength in the treated hand, and then three different doses, and uh, suppression. Fascinating neurosurgery, guys. We get, this, we get this, the patients go into an MRI scanner, functional MRI, we ask them to move their hands. And then we, on the opposite side of the brain, we detect the area where they've moved the hands. And Adam then uses that to do the craniotomy for localization. Then we record. We record both from the motor neurons there um, spontaneously. And then we ask the patient to move the hand and record again so we know we got to the right place. 21 sites of transplant. Uh, and we do a nine-hole pin test, which is a simple way of showing fan function. And we're going to be comparing right and left over time. This, again, unilateral, unique design, very powerful because you use the other hand as a control. Um, we got 16 patients in line. Uh, we treated the first one in June 21, and the trial is now still recruiting, still open. And so Pablo's here. If anybody has any patients down here, uh, we'd be happy to take a look. Uh, this is the first two patients. You can see from the MRI when we do the transplant, and Vivian might talk about this as well, you get a little white area exactly over the motor cortex, which then resolves in a week. This is because of electron spin change, water spin change. Uh, and you see it in the MRI, but then it, then it resolves. Uh, and just uh, two. Literally yesterday, we got some slides back from the first patient who passed away from the trial. And we are seeing some evidence of cells. We don't know for sure if these are transplant, but they look like a transplant in the right area of the motor cortex. So we've targeted it looks like pretty good. 
And I just got a text from Pablo with some GDNF slides. We're literally, as I speak, doing GDNF staining for the first time in the motor cortex of a patient with ALS who's had the transplant. And we're following these patients, obviously, very carefully over time for function, but too early to tell anything yet uh, functionally. And obviously, at the end, we want a combined stem cell approach and, and a combined upper and lower approach. And this is a lovely review from Hideyuki Okano, which really summarizes where we want to end up. If we can get all the safety in the cortex and the spinal cord, we'll then go both sites and we'll do cervical. Neurosurgeons love to talk to, they love to be active and doing stuff. So they're very happy to do transplants up and down the cord. And then the patient goes home. It's a one and done. And if it works, they don't have to do anything else. After their suppression, the cells are going to do the work. And they're going to release the GDNF for free. Amgen hate me for that when I used to give this talk. Um, but the cells are making the GDNF. We're doing a lot of different things. And just to finish, uh, I'll, I'll I'll say we started actually in Parkinson's disease because GDNF is good for Parkinson's, and we're still working with Chris Bankovich on that. We've worked with Leslie Thompson here on Huntington's. Uh, we've worked with Matt Blurton Jones at Irvine with, uh, with Alzheimer's, and we've worked with Gary Steinberg in stroke. Uh, all these papers are out there, many years of work. Uh, and then, of course, ALS is our main part. Now, retinitis pigmentosa, if I had another half an hour, I'd tell you about that trial, um, but you can read about it. We're on patient nine. These cells survive at the back of the eye, and we're hoping they will slow down blindness in RP as uh, an active trial as well. In Parkinson's, we have uh, just trying to get to the IND stage to do a trial in Parkinson's. Maybe we'll complement uh, what Vivian's going to tell you about in a moment by doing GDNF protection. And then, of course, we're trying to get to IPS. For, this is all fetal, <laughs> just like Irv. Uh, it's a, it, the fetal tissue creates the perfect astrocyte through normal development. We have to try and now create it through IPS technology. I don't know if we're going to get there. I don't know if we're going to get such a good astrocyte. And I think fetal tissue, and this is for CERM, I think fetal tissue is still essential in embryonic stem cells because they do it, fetal does it right. We try and do it, and we have played with trying to make it, but we don't know how well we're doing it. So I think the future is, is going to be IPS. So the last couple of slides, this is a setup, stem cells in space. Um, we've had two missions to the space. In fact, Kat, I went to your mission control just, just across there for, for all of Kat's work in space down here and, and Allison. Very jealous. We have to get a mission, mission control at Cedar sinai room. Um, but we've only had two missions. We haven't got quite as far as, as, uh, as all, of, all of you have here. Um, and uh, the, the one that you'll, and why are we doing it? So pluripotency is, is, is very interesting. It's different states. And the, the theory is, as you go down those different states, you make all the tissues you've heard about at this meeting. So really, it's, an, it's a thing. Of, does gravity affect that is my simple question. And the question is, does removing gravity keep iPSCs in a highly pluripotent state? And that's a very simple question. And we're going to test it on the space station. Um, and this is Axiom's picture of their new station. You'll hear more about that later. Uh, and you'll see Peggy later on. It's nice to show a picture when she's actually going to be here. <laughs> oh, she's already here. Hi. Hi, Peggy. I've, I haven't met you yet, but uh, it's great to see you. And this is Peggy in space. <laughs> and again, you'll be seeing more of this later on. So at the first mission, and Peggy was part of it, uh, they, did the transfe they, they did some transfections. They grew the IPS lines uh, on the space station. Um, the results are under review at the moment at cell reports. If anybody's a reviewer here, please hurry up. Um, <laughs> uh, current mission uh, is aimed at making the first IPS in microgravity. We don't know what it, how that's going to work, but we think it might help sustain a high level of pluripotency. And make them. Anybody who's grown IPS knows how difficult they are to grow. They always want to differentiate. Well, we think in zero G they may grow better, faster, more reliably. And not that we're going to grow them in space. We'd love to do that. We might. But we might learn the gene expression patterns that drive that e efficiency and growth. And now we can just CRISPR edit lines on Earth to mimic what happened in space. So that's kind of the bottom line. Thank you, everyone. Take home is uh, modeling diseases using IPS, especially organ chips. We hope to le lead to this new, uh, new human twin models, we call them, uh, for testing and uh, drug testing. And then the neural progenitor product been using for all these years, and so has Irv and others in fetal tissue, I think still have hope in the clinic. I did hear some updates from Asteris recently for spinal cord injury. That trial is an old trial. It's looking very encouraging. That's oligodendrocyte. So a lot of fun stuff coming from fetal tra transplants, which will transition into IPS uh, in the future. And now the most important part, of course, is all the people who did the work. Um, Michael and, and Gad set up the blood-brain barrier, and this whole team has been in and out of my lab. Uh, and especially uh, hats off to Sam. Sam Sanchez is now in in Citro uh, using uh, their technology. A massive group, CERN, thank you, and all of uh, my, my company, which is Cedar sinai <laughs> uh, It's amazing doing these trials, but we could lean into pharmacy um, and risk management and everything, and they allowed us to do this trial with the CERN funding. 
And then most of all, I really want to thank the 18 patients that could participated. Uh, we really can send them properly. So it's not going to cure your ALS, but we're going to learn an enormous amount. And one day we may get there. And then finally, very, uh, hats off to, to all of my companions, many of you in, in the audience here, uh, Jana and others, uh, for all their help with the NASA studies. And, and there's people from NASA here as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing that later. Thanks very much. Okay, so some questions. Uh oh, it's Jeannie. <laughs> Who's also done a lot of space work, I will say. Jeannie, yeah. congratulations well, see, on the space If you'd said that, I wouldn't be asking you a question. <laughs> um, so, I, one of my concerns is obviously acquisition of mutations during proliferation of cells. And so, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm just questioning the idea to get them to proliferate longer when that will mean more DNA errors and perhaps, um, and also, as you know, CRISPR is a genomic vandal. I said that already yesterday. Um, and we're finding out that there are a lot of, of changes in the genome. I don't know if any of those are important. They may not be. But I think we need to be aware of them, don't you think? I mean, Absol I absolutely. And FDA are very aware of them as well. And we, we spent a long time discussing you know, what is the appropriate level of safety for the trial. And I think somebody said yesterday, though, if you have ALS, you might take some risk, right? It's a risk benefit. If you have migraine and you're going to get a stem cell transplant, you might want to be very careful. So there's a kind of a, a, a yin and yang here, and there's an FD, the FDA really reviewing this carefully. And we do pick up mutations in the cells as they expand. We all know that. The question is, is that going to cause a tumor or cancerous tumor in the patient? And if, if the answer is no, then I think we can go ahead. If the answer is yes, then don't. But I think we can't really second guess at the moment exactly which mutation is going to cause a problem. So it's a very practical thing. And the FDA just wants you to do the preclinical studies and prove your product didn't cause tumors or cancer, and then you can go ahead. You, uh, you mentioned the relationship between the gut and the brain. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about the relationship between uh, the gut and the peripheral nerve system that is quite close to it? Uh, can you tell us more about that? Michael Workman could. I know they were doing uh, enteric nervous system transplants along with gut transplants, and he had a lovely paper with Jim Wells in Nature Medicine looking at, look, Ideally, we put all these cell types together, peripheral nervous system, the gut, the brain. We're building a kind of body on a chip or a body full of organoids. I don't know. We're getting closer to that to get all the interactions going. So, so I agree that's important. Um, but you can only ask so many questions, and I only have so many hours in the day. <laughs> okay. I have a quick question. Clive, yeah. I wonder how easy it would be to adapt your platform of you know, disease on a chip for brain cancer. Yes. I mean, we have you know, such a difficult time of trying to get immuno... Uh, checkpoint blockade and you know working and whether this can be a good platform to test. And of course you'd be interested in that. And, yeah. and we are doing that with uh, Alex Lubomov and some other people at Cedars. We're getting glioblastoma lines, putting them on the top, mm. and then we're flowing uh, blood through the bottom. And we're seeing how things, well, first of all, how does that glioblastoma function when you, you can add drugs from the blood side? But the other way around, we're taking brain cells on the top and putting metastatic cancer cells through the blood, because some cancers go easily to the brain, breast cancer, and understanding how does, what attracted that cancer cell to go into the brain and migrate, just the way I showed in that video. And we can do that, and we'd love to work with people to set those models up. I think it's very powerful. Flow is good, but they're never going to be perfect, right? There's always right. going to be missing parts in these right. models. I always liken it to, when I was growing up, I used to build these, uh, you probably this, build these model planes with airfix glue, and you build them all together made of plastic. You get the little kit, and it comes in the mail in the old days, not Amazon. <laughs> I th I'm sure I was getting into sniffing the glue more than anything else, but anyway, it was, I have a great memory. But when you built it, it was a Spitfire, you know, or a Messerschmitt. Um, would you fly that plane? No. <laughs> in other words, we're building models. We're building models like that plastic plane. They're not the real thing. The real question is, can you validate that model in a clinical trial? Does it predict cancer cat that, 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 that goes, invades or doesn't invade? How good are our predictions? We have to work with the hospitals and, and translate some of this and make sure our models have value in patients. That's when, it, that's when the rubber will hit the road. Otherwise, they're just models. Great. Truly exciting. Okay. Uh, one more round of applause for... Sorry. Oh, we have one more. Sorry. One more question back here. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I just had a quick uh -huh. question. Um, uh -huh. I understand that ALS has a higher occurrence rate in men and that also the condition manifests differently in men and women. Yes. And I was just wondering um, if sex-specific differences in the motor neurons themselves is responsible for that discrepancy. And if so, what are those differences? 
Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And of course, uh, males do get, uh, get ALS more, more uh, frequently than females. We're in the middle of looking at why XY chromosome loading and non-autonomous loading and trying to understand how that intersects with uh, pathology in the day. It's a great question. And I think it would lead us right to more specific therapies for men and women if we can model it in men and women in the dish. And, and that's an active area of research. And it just came out of unbiased analysis of the data. I'm a control freak, the lab will tell you. I love controls. And we did it unbiased, the PCA, and everybody was getting frustrated. We can't tell ALS in control, we can't tell. But suddenly this group popped out unbiasedly, which is male motor neurons and female, and that was real data. If you do unbiased science, you get real data. If you're biased at the beginning, you know what you want to see, be careful. 